So that was a situational awareness. I was just getting a sense of what's running on your network, um, you know, depending on what kinds of questions you ask, like what slices of your data in different ways. Look at things beyond just the standard five couple and the standard top end counts, um, depending on what you're doing. Um, a little bit more about the content analytics. So, um, beaconing is periodic behavior in the network. Um, there are lots of things that beacon um, software updates. Uh, NTP, those kinds of things. We don't care about most of them, but occasionally things begin, which we as security people do care about. Um, the big one is remote access tools uh, and it's kind of box and what they are. Um, so remote access tool like Poison Ivy, oftentimes we get installed on a remote machine and then we'll phone home um, periodically. Um, in the case of Poison Ivy, you can uh, take the beacon activity where it's phoning home. Uh, and uh, look for the uh, interactive session when someone actually remotely takes control of the machine and, and pair those two things to create a, a flow-based heuristic signature of, of uh, the beacon network. Uh, so beacon detection on its own can often be paired up with some other indicator for uh, an event of interest. So poison ID in particular, uh, Offers characterized by three packets uh, with a SIM flag for the phone home phase. So it's installed, it says, phone home, it says, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, somebody takes control, and you get a long interactive session with a roughly symmetrical byte count. Uh, this actually came out of uh, some MIP work I did as an intern. Uh, yeah, so symmetric byte count meaning that if there's 3,000 bytes sent, there's 3,000 bytes yeah. answered. Yeah. So is it like echoing like a telnet session sort of thing? Or? Uh, well, I'm kind of wondering why it would be symmetric. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I think it is echoing. Most uh, user interaction sessions are very symmetric. So you know, that's the stage. Mm -hmm. the things with the user it has to have a constant stream of reactive bits to what you're doing to the session. It's going to look far more symmetric than something like machine where you, know, you set a command off and Sometime and come back, which is for GP. Send in response. It's fairly short, otherwise, you just get your stuff. Specifically with Poison IV, it does an initial uh, authentication of the client to the server. So it sends a uh, 256 byte, I think, uh, blob of data that then gets encrypted using the shared key, and that's sent back. Um, so this actually came out of some minor research work I did as an intern, um, where we, you know, we actually found poison ivy in an operational setting by doing this, taking a beacon detector and pairing it with a, something to look for a long symmetric uh, session. Um, so you know, some of the other ideas I was talking about were a little more, uh, more proposals, a little more uh, uh, research. This actually, we've got a script that does this and it works in practice. So. Um, there are lots of things that begin that we don't care about. Um, Ajax, uh, asynchronous JavaScript over XML, uh, you know, the thing that's refreshing your web page and not completely reloading it. Uh, periodic software updates, Chrome updates, Firefox updates, Adobe updates, Flash updates, Java updates, Windows updates, well, uh, yeah, uh, NTP also uh, looks like beginning. Right, so, so if you just stick a beacon detector on your network, it's probably not going to tell you a whole lot, which is why you need some, you know, usually some other uh, indication of, of whether it's going to be something you care about, something else to latch on to. Um, but beaconing is a start. Um, there are also ways uh, you can get around beaconing, right? So if you intentionally randomize your uh, phoning home such that it's not happening at a regular interval and it's, it's not going to look like beaconing, it's if you've got something that's looking for that regularity, it's not going to find it. Um, and then you've got the economic behavior over channels, right? So if you're uh, embedding your uh, information inside uh, other traffic or making it look like something else, uh, it's one way to get around uh, this beacon detector. Um, and I mentioned this in, in uh, with respect to beaconing, but it's also relevant to a lot of the other elements. There, there are 
find are great things you can do beyond just net flow, right? So you can look at individual packet headers, right? Net flow is just a, it's an aggregation, it's a summary. Um, it doesn't give you individual packet headers, uh, which is something you can look at. You can look at time series information there, right? Uh, certainly, deep packet inspection, uh, you know, looking at actual content, drilling down into PCAP. And then, um, so I've been talking about beaconing, it's, it's been uh, time based, but you can look at things beyond time, right? You can look at uh, sizes, um, you can look at particular flags, um, those kinds of things. So, that was beaconing. Uh, this is talking about chaining. Um, chaining is looking for <coughs> connections between computers that are the same in some way. So host A connects to host B on port 22, and then host B connects to host C on port 22. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be linear. I've got an example up here that's you know, a tree. Um, where host A connects to host B, and then host B connects to host C and D. Also, it connects to B and A connects to F, right? Um, the idea here is that you, you're looking for some connection that is common in some way within some temporal window. So you're looking for connections that start within the same Five minute interval or say an hour, you know, it's going to depend on exactly what use of these things. Um, that sort of wording definition up there is you're looking for temporarily correlated net flows to satisfy common link predicates. Where common link predicates have something in common. Uh, so, example predicates, uh, destination port is sort of the obvious one to start with. So, like I said, port 22. Uh, Port 3389 is RDP, right? So you can look for chaining through RDP sessions. Um, you can also look for chaining uh, within uh, NetBIOS and SMB. Uh, the 137.38.39.4.5, the, the chatty Windows protocols. Um, there are other, I, I don't have an example up here, but there are other ways you can look for chaining too, right? Beyond just D4, you can look at path sizes of flows. Um, you can look at source port information. Uh, you can also do something where you're looking uh, not just for the exactly the same thing, but maybe you're looking for something slightly differently. So uh, you look for a connection from A to B uh, in some certain way, and then a connection from B to C that's slightly different than a connection from uh, C to D that's the same as the first one, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be the exact same thing each time. Uh, it's going to depend on what you're doing. Uh, and there are a lot of use cases for training. Um, worm detection is, is sort of the obvious one. There's uh, some academic research that was done uh, originally, uh, some of it was done later actually, uh, looking at worm detection for chains. So you build this graph of uh, connections on your network and you look for uh, uh, chaining events and connections that are happening very quickly. Um, letter propagation is another one, right? So an attack fits into the network uh, and it wants to move around, maybe over SMB. Uh, Perhaps over a different protocol, but he's doing so. Uh, you know, if he's hopping from host A to host B and then from host B to host C, that's going to look like a chain. Uh, scanner detection is one of those ones I hadn't really thought about until I actually sat down and implemented this. I realized that scanners also look like they're chaining. Um, the idea here is you've got some scanner, uh, we've actually got some active network scanners at the minor port meet site. Uh, they're scanning uh, all of our clients. Um, So if you've got a network scanner and it happens to uh, scan port 80 on me and I'm on a standard client, odds are good if I've got a user on the box, I'm going to go out on port 80 uh, at some time shortly thereafter after just because I'm you know, a person doing my job and I have to browse the web a lot. Uh, that's going to look like a chain link too, right? Because the scanner connected to me on port 80 and I connected to an actual web server on port 80. Uh, so if you're, at, if you're actually doing scanning and are, are I'm sorry, implement chaining and are looking uh, at it in an operational setting, you might see active network scanners in there and you have to filter those out. Um, of course, you can look for scanning uh, the way we did earlier and sort of drop those kinds of flows. So you can drop flows with low byte counts uh, or flows that lack uh, reset or things. Um, root cause analysis. This is, uh, I think, another big one. Um, so you've got some security incident, right? You've got an IDS alert or you've got or your time detector went off, uh, whatever the case may be, if you want to uh, understand what happened uh, 
around that time. Chain is one way to get information on what was going on, right? You can chain uh, backwards to find out who would affect this host. Uh, maybe if you've got a piece of malware and you know what its network footprint looks like, you don't normally connect this way. You can chain backwards from uh, a given infected host to understand who infected it. Uh, and you can chain forward to find out who it infected. And by that way, uh, figure out what the footprint of that virus is in your network uh, and deal with it. Um, Attribution sort of sub order of cause analysis. Um, so again, go back. So let's let's talk uh, about the lateral movement example again. You've got chaining over SMB, and you can find out where that chain started. Maybe then you can go back and try to figure out uh, where the attack came in from. Uh, so figure out what's you know going on. Um, proxy and app detection. Uh, it's sort of the same thing as network scanner detection. Uh, the tunnel detection, which I sort of alluded to earlier, right? So you've got chaining, let's say it's over SSH, uh, we've got attention from A to B, uh, port 22, and another one from B to C on port 22, and they've got roughly the same size, and uh, roughly this, they happen at the same time. That's probably tunneling. Maybe somebody's using uh, a box as a hot point. So, um, over tunneling is you know, another good example of chaining. So that was chaining. Anybody have any questions on that or anything else? I covered the control kind of text. Okay. So, uh, we've got a example network up here, four routers, uh, a bunch of switches, a bunch of clients, and we're looking at four next flow at two different places, right? We've got a passive tap between routers A and B. Collecting traffic on this link, and we're also censoring up the switching. We're having that close there, so we've got two different views into this network, and we've got some connection uh, from the outside to this this uh, one machine. Okay, next. So the question here is, uh, yeah, what what uh, what flows are in the wrong place? What flows either am I missing? Uh, you know, what flows I expect to see, but I don't see, or what <laughs> flows uh, are extra. Am I seeing flows I didn't expect, places I didn't expect? Um, next slide. So if we talk about uh, either extra flows or missing flows, what are some reasons you might see flows uh, neither of those two categories? Uh, anybody have any ideas? What are some reasons you might see flow at one sensor that you didn't see at another that you expected to, or vice versa? It was blocked by the firewall. The one you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you've got a firewall or something else, it's blocking the flow. You have a broken sensor. Yes, that's a big one. Yeah, so uh, misconfigurations or uh, outages or just your sensors broken in some way. Anybody <laughs> else? Anybody else want anything? No. No ideas? No ideas at all. No, not a single one. Okay. Anybody else have any ideas? Like Charles, it's not. It's May not be laid out the way you think it is. Yeah, right. Right. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so if your network isn't laid out the way you think it is, if maybe if you've got uh, alternate routing, you've got some routing back door, uh, such that there's a path out of your network that you weren't aware of. So one reason you might see this, uh, sort of going along the routing back door is, uh, so this is a quadcopter, right, a small helicopter. Um, what if you take the Wi-Fi access point of this thing and land it on somebody's roof, and you've got a, a wireless network uh, that, you know, uh, isn't 
controlled by the people who own the building, um, but it's, it's a, an exfiltration path. Um, we actually did a, a test of this. Uh, um, yeah, we literally had a quadcopter. Um, we literally take masks and go and put around the building. Uh, it's kind of fun. Um, but the idea is you make a piece of malware that uh, turns on a wireless card on your laptop and it sends data to this wireless access point. Um, the command and controller is an exfiltration mechanism. Um, you know, you're not going to see that with your standard network sensor. You will see a plus flow to run a push flow on the box, though, right? So if you're collecting uh, net flow on the box itself, you're going to see even traffic that's not going over your, your standard wired network. So when you're seeing a command and control C2 on an XML channel, uh, wireless is one way you might, one reason you might see that. Uh, there's an interesting presentation at DEF CON 2012 on owning Netgear routers. Uh, so the author used an FTL injection attack for initial access. And used an input sanity transition for arbitrary file access. And finally, a buffer overflow uh, for root access. And it got root on a, a NetFlow, sorry, an router. Um, so once you're on that router, uh, what do you do? You need to uh, send data. But uh, for me, I might not use the uh, IP address on the router, right? So one analyst I didn't talk about that I should have was uh, you could look for traffic to and from the interfaces on your routers, right? You should know who your router admins are. You should know what boxes they're admitting your routers from. Uh, there are other admin connections to your routers. It's something you probably want to look into, understand. Um, so maybe if you uh, remotely own a router, uh, somebody else's router, you want to uh, send and receive data from it with a spoofed IP address. Uh, so that it doesn't look like it actually, actually going to the router, uh, such that it may get one on, may look like it's going to a client machine. Um, so uh, back in a few slides that I'm trying to picture. So if I see a flow here at this sensor that says it's destined for 192.168.11, uh, but I don't see that flow at the switch, maybe it's actually stopping at that router. Uh, and, and beyond just uh, remotely owning Netgear routers, there are supply chain risks, uh, right? So the FBI did an investigation in 2008 of counterfeit Cisco routers from China. Um, so there's some supply chain issues there. You know this Biden VMTC that I Oh, did that? Yep. Cool. And there are a uh, lot of vulnerabilities in, in uh, I'm not sure how else that word, but OA routers. Uh, the large Chinese manufacturer, Huawei. Uh, Huawei. Huawei, thank you. Huawei routers. Uh, right, so session hijacking vulnerabilities, deep overflow vulnerabilities, stack overflow vulnerabilities. Uh, and lots of calls to insecure codes. So, so the point was these routers, the firmware was not well. <coughs> Ideally, you want to dip the flows you see at sensors. So I saw look, these flows at this sensor, I saw these flows at this other sensor, and you join the two up. Um, however, it, literally, it's a join, and it's computationally expensive, right? You have to have all your data in one place. Um, one thing you might try doing is aggregating. Um, so I saw a thousand flows uh, to this cider block uh, during this time period at this sensor, how many I say this other sensor. Um, you know, aggregate up a little bit. Um, and again, host flow is helpful with visibility. Uh, one thing you could do if you've got host flow or simple control running, you, you dip it with your net flow sensor if you've got one. So, what flows do I see in host flow? What flows do I see uh, with my network sensor? Are there any differences there? Um, and beyond just affecting things like somebody who's uh, you know, doing something really kind of out there and funky, this is going to tell you something is broken, right? How do you know your network sensor is working the way you think it is? How do you know it's collecting all the traffic you think it should be? Uh, this is one way to sort of sanity check. 